I really love you all. <laughs> I know that we have a lot on our minds this morning, but top of mind for many is the situation going on in Ukraine right now. I've heard from so many of you uh, just wondering how we can help, what we can do. If you're not aware, on the homepage of our website, there's a link where you can find ideas for prayer and ways to help. Uh, so please join us in that. And I wanted to start our time to get today by praying for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. So would you join me in prayer? Oh, Almighty God, we ask that you would be present in this conflict as only you can, would you guide from death to life, from war to peace, from suffering to justice. Let your great love shine brightly. Give peace to these nations, to their homes, and to their hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This moment feels a little like something that I saw during the Winter Olympics. Did any of you watch Winter Olympics? If you're joining us online, type in the chat what your favorite winter sport is. And I'm going to ask everybody here today, what, just shout out, what are some of your favorite winter sports? Skiing, snowboarding, sledding. <laughs> Someone in the last service said throwing snowballs. That, that, like, that's not a... But... It was fun watching the different sports, and while I was watching the speed skating relay, I saw something that relates to the moment that we're in right now. I want to show you a clip. Pay particular attention to the transitions. Did, did you see what happened in the transition? If you're online, type it in the chat. What, what, did, what happened in the transition? Give him a push. All right, before the, the one team member transitioned off, gave their other team member a big push forward. And we're in a moment like that today. Many of you know I'm going to be transitioning off of the Good Shepherd team onto a new pastoral call with First Lutheran in Alexandria, Minnesota. But before I leave, I have one more chance to give you a big push forward. I'm starting the, the sermon series that's going to carry you through all the way till Easter. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to give you a push forward because I really love this church. And I want to do everything I possibly can to help you move forward in a positive direction. I really think the sermon series is going to be helpful for Good Shepherd, especially in this season of ministry right now. It's a lot of changes taking place. A lot of changes in our world. A lot of changes in our church. Change feels unsettling. And scary. In times of change, you, you look for that steady constant that you can cling to and count on. And in this series, we're going to explore the one thing that you can always cling to and always count on. If you can just grasp this truth, you can move forward into the future with confidence. Are you guys ready to get going? Yeah. It's my last time. Come on, let's. <laughs> Uh, so the series is, is about covenants. And I know the word covenant is an obscure word. Maybe you heard it in, in church or in confirmation, but you don't really know what it means. Talking about covenants feels a little bit like playing the game Balderdash. Have any of you played the game Balderdash? You're given an obscure word and you have to guess what the real definition is. I thought it'd be fun to play around with you right now. So here's your word, dipnosophist. Tur turn to somebody near you and give your best guess at what diagnosophist means. Go. <laughs> All right, I'll call you back. I'm a little scared to even hear what your guesses were, but by itself, you may not know what the word means. However, if I give you a little bit of context, all of a sudden, it becomes a little bit more clear. Listen to this sentence. 
it's important to invite a diagnosticist to dinner parties to keep the conversation going. Do you have a better idea now of what it means? Yeah, a diagnosticist is someone who's good at conversations. So, a l- little bit of context. And, and, and it, you help, it helps you understand the meaning and why the word is important. So as, as we start this series on covenants, I want to give you a little bit of context so that hopefully you'll better understand the meaning of this word and why it's so important. Because covenants reveal the one constant that you can cling to and count on at all times. The word itself, covenant, it comes from the Latin convenire. It means to come together. And it refers to when people come together to make an agreement. I'm, I'm sure all of you have made an agreement with another person at some point in your life. Maybe it was a pinky swear, or you signed a contract, or you shook on a deal. The Bible is organized around covenants. Another word for covenant that you might be more familiar with is testament. We have an Old Testament and a New Testament. That The Bible's organized around covenants. Covenants And the covenants we're talking about are the covenants that are initiated by God. There's lots of different ways to gain new understandings. My son is the kind of person who, if we didn't stop him, he would take apart the fan in his room to figure out how it works. Do you know anybody like that? So I thought, why don't, why don't we look at some of the parts of God's covenant to see how they work? And we'll specifically look at three parts to God's covenant, the root the byproduct, and the seal. The root or the core of God's covenants is a relationship. In Jeremiah 31, 33, God said, but this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days. I will put my instructions deep within them. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. At the root of every one of God's covenants is a relationship. I will be their God. They will be my people. God wants to have a relationship with you. I've been talking with some of our confirmation students to see what they've been learning on their journey. And it's fun. Several of them mentioned that they learned that they can be a friend with God. That God's not some distant entity in the sky far away, but God is someone that you can actually talk to and connect with. I hope you know that as well, that Christianity is not primarily about rules or religion. At the root of every one of God's covenants is a God who desires to be in a close, loving relationship with you. The byproduct or the result of God's covenants is a blessing. We are blessed to be in a relationship with God because God knows what's best for us, wants what's best for us, has what's best for us, and is what's best for us. God wants to bless you. But apart from God, we deal with consequences and curses. And that's not what God wants. God wants to bless you and make you a blessing. A perfect example is the covenant that God made with Abraham. In Genesis 12, 2 to 3, God says to Abraham, I will bless you and make you a blessing, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. The byproduct of every one of God's covenants is a blessing. And then the seal, or the confirmation of God's covenants, is a sign. God always gives a visual sign to confirm that God will honor God's part of the covenant, that God will keep God's promises. It's something that we can look to and at times look back on to remember that we can count on God. A very familiar sign is the one that God gave to Noah. It was a a colorful sign in the sky. Anybody know what it was? A rainbow, yeah. These three parts of the covenant show us how it works. At the root is a relationship. The byproduct is a blessing. And the seal is a sign. Now, the problem with covenants is that we break them. Can you think of a time in your life where someone broke their promise to you? It's horrible. Or how about a time when 
you broke your promise to someone else. The problem with covenants is that we break them. And that's why we needed a new covenant with God. Going back to Jeremiah 31, God said, The day is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife. Did you catch the three parts of the covenant? You had the relationship. God loves them, wants to be with them. The blessing, that God wanted to hold their hand to help them through. And then the sign that God delivered them from slavery in Egypt. Sadly, after all of that, the people still broke the covenant. God was their God, but they didn't act like God's people. They didn't trust God. They didn't love God. They didn't follow God. They tried to live life their own way on their own. And as a result, as a byproduct, they traded God's bless for their mess. They acted in ways that hurt God, hurt others, hurt themselves. It was just a mess. And I imagine that many of you have experienced the mess that comes from trying to live life apart from God. We experience the mess and brokenness in our relationships, in our soul, in our world. So many people are heartbroken about what's happening between Russia and Ukraine. What what a living example of the kind of mess that is created when we fight, when we hurt, when we think only about our own selfish gain. That's not the way God designed us to live or desires for us to live. But sadly, we, we break God's covenant. If you read through the Old Testament and as you go through the series, you're going to see people break God's covenant as individuals, as families, as nations, and even as communities of faith. But the good news for us is that God does not break covenants. God is faithful to keep God's promises. I love this verse, 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. When we broke our end of the covenant, God said, all right, I'm going to make a new one. I'm going to make a new way for you to be in relationship with me, to experience my blessings. And the sign of this new covenant would be Jesus' death and resurrection. In Jesus, God did what you could never do. Jesus lived the perfect life. He took the punishment for your wrongs. He overcame evil. He defeated death So that when you open your heart to Jesus, he can forgive you, transform you, and equip you to live a brand new life with God forever. I love how the eternal eternal new covenant is articulated in Hebrews chapter 13, 20 to 21. It says, now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you Through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him, all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. God is faithful to keep God's promises. And that's why God is the one constant that you can cling to and count on at all times. I will admit, though, it's not always easy to cling to God and count on God especially when you go through times that are challenging and times of change. This past month, I have dealt with a whole bunch of health challenges, and nothing has gone smoothly. I've had infections and bad reactions and delays. And I'll just be honest with you. I've had a hard time seeing God in the midst of it and trusting God through it. I imagine that you can relate to times when you've gone through challenges And it's been really hard for you to see God and trust God through it. The people who Hebrews was written to could relate. They had put their faith in Jesus, and all of a sudden, they were experiencing persecution. It's probably not all that different than what's happening in Ukraine. Their property was taken away from them. They were forced to leave their homes and their cities. They lost family and friends and opportunities. They lost their financial security. It was scary. It was hard for them to trust God and to see God in the midst of it. And most of them were just ready to give up. 
So the author of Hebrews writes to this community and says, don't, please don't give up. You can cling to God and count on God at all times because God keeps God's promises. Which begs the question, well, what does God promise? Well, God does not promise that life will be easy. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Jesus says, you can guarantee, I can guarantee you that you're going to have trials and troubles in this world. Why? We live in a sinful, broken world. You're going to experience the mess from time to time. What God does promise is God says, I will be your God. Whatever you go through, I will be your God. We get a glimpse of what that means in this blessing from Hebrews 13. God says, I, I'm a God of peace. I've been reading in my morning devotion the story of, of Jacob in the Bible. Jacob blew apart his family with lying, cheating, stealing. And he's, he runs away from his family, but he can't outrun God, which you can't do either, by the way. And God stops him midway and says, hey, I'm still going to keep my end of the covenant. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a blessing. And he has Jacob erect a pillar as a sign of the covenant. And sure enough, God is faithful to keep God's promises. Then by the time that Jacob comes back around to that pillar, he had found peace with God, found peace with himself, and made peace with his family. Our world, more than ever, needs the peace of God. And God says, I will be your God of peace. Also, I will be a God of power. The power that raised Jesus from the dead. God says, there is nothing too bad, nothing too broken, that I cannot raise it to new life or bring good from it. And God promises that he will be our great shepherd. He says, I will lead you and guide you and care for you every step of the way. In our limited perspective, we can't always see what God is up to in the midst of our challenges and changes. Often, that clarity comes from looking back on what God has done. There's a woman in our church who had heard about some of the health challenges that I was going through, and, and she wrote and shared an encouraging testimony with me. She said, many years ago, her husband left her with three young boys. She was devastated, didn't know how they were going to survive, definitely did not see God in that. But as she looks back now, she's able to see how God brought caring people into their life and into their family, how God provided for their needs. Years later, God brought a Christian man into her life that became a wonderful husband and stepfather and now grandfather. And she was sharing that story to say, hey, cling to God, count on God. God will see you through. I, I witnessed another powerful example of this kind of audacious faith in the Ukraine. You, maybe you saw this clip, but th there were a bunch of Christian believers gathered, sheltering under a bridge during the conflict. And what did they do? They just start singing praises to God in their language. Listen. author of Hebrews shares many other testimonies of faith. In Hebrews 11, which is sometimes referred to as the Faith Hall of Fame, the author looks back at the centuries of God's faithfulness. So many times God's people had found themselves in situations that seemed helpless and hopeless. And yet every time the God of peace, the God of power, the great shepherd made a way for God's people. And I, I truly believe that the people of Good Shepherd can trust in God 
and cling to God during this time of change and challenge. Because God has seen Good Shepherd through difficult times before. Many years ago, Good Shepherd had a, a lead pastor that only stayed for a year and a half. The pastor did good things, wasn't a really good fit, and they resigned, leaving Good Shepherd without a, a pastoral shepherd for a season of time. But Good Shepherd always had the Good Shepherd, the Great Shepherd, Jesus, to lead the way. And not long after that, God brought Pastor Greg and then Pastor Gary, and Pastor Glenn, and myself, and many other gifted staff and congregational leaders. The God of peace, the God of power, the great shepherd will make a way again for good shepherd as long as you keep your eyes on Jesus. God is faithful to keep God's promises. God will be our God, so what's left? for us to be God's people. And the author of Hebrews describes a little bit about what that looks like in Hebrews 13. I kept being drawn back to this scripture as I was preparing for today because their concluding words are fitting for a lot of the things that I'm thinking about in my final sermon and help me give you a good push as, as a last message. And I want to just really quickly run through seven words of encouragement in Hebrews 13. I know you won't remember them all, but I would ask, bookmark Hebrews 13. Read it, study it, come back to it again and again during this time of transition. It will serve you well. But here we go. Verse 1, keep on loving each other. Good shepherd is good at loving one of my favorite stories is when a social worker from the police department introduced me to a young woman who was dying of cancer. And this woman was an immigrant. She didn't have any family or support, any money. I shared the story with our church. and Several women from Good Shepherd rallied around and took her under their wings. They loved her so well that the social worker ended up coming to Good Shepherd and then experienced the love of this church in a new way as her daughter with special needs participated in our fusion program. You're good at loving, so keep on loving each other. During this time of transition, don't let any root of conflict or division seep in. Just continue to love each other, love the community like Jesus loves us, with compassion, kindness, commitment. Verse 2, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. I had the privilege of, of starting and growing our welcome ministry with fantastic leaders like Bob Dean. And our goal has always been, whether you're you know, coming for the hundredth time or brand new, that you would feel the love of Jesus before you even hear about it. And during times of conflict, challenge, change, sometimes it's, it's easy to turn inward, you know, to think only about yourself, protect what you have. But please, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. Keep your eyes looking outward. Make sure everybody feels welcome in this community of faith. And Maybe some of you will, will join the welcome team, which would be great. But I think it goes beyond that. I got a message from someone in the church this week, and they said, if there's ever an opportunity to host a refugee from Ukraine, we'd love to welcome them in our home. I know everybody can't do that, but... Visit our website. Find at least one way that you can pray or help. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. Verse 4, give honor to marriage. Marriage was designed by God to be an illustration of God's covenant love. And yet so many couples are struggling in their marriage. If that's you, you are not alone. Several years ago, my wife and I partnered with a, a, a bunch of other couples to start a marriage ministry. None of us had perfect marriages, ours included. We just said, hey, we're going to seek God and we're going to support each other. And from that has come so many wonderful testimonies of transformed marriages and families, one of them being the new point leaders, Beth and Chet Hartsock. So whatever your age, whatever your stage of life, Continue to help Good Shepherd support marriages and families. Number five, 
Don't love money. Money is not bad. But we live in a culture that idolizes money, right? We're, we're taught to fear that you don't have enough to get everything that you possibly can for yourself. I've had the, the privilege of leading several generosity initiatives with Good Shepherd, and we've learned together that true life, true satisfaction, it's not found in what you get. It's found in what you give. And so I would encourage you to, to keep giving thanks to God for what you have and then keep giving it away to do good and to help those in need. Verse, oh, and God backs that one with a promise. God says, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Verse 7, remember your leaders and follow their example. I'm going to remember you all. I hope you remember me. If there's one thing, though, that I hope you remember and that I hope you follow is to keep growing in your relationship with God. I desire to keep growing in my relationship and to help other people do the same. That's been the inspiration behind my work with children's ministry, special needs, fusion, our uh, student ministry, young adult ministry, adults, senior adults. It's been the inspiration behind our small group ministry. And I learned that over 300 people now have been through our Rooted small group, which helps you connect with God, the church, your purpose. We have another session coming up, and I would encourage you, if you've not been through it, participate in a group. If you have been through it, lead a group. Two more real quick. Verse 17, give leaders a reason for joy. Good Shepherd, your leaders right now are leading through a really challenging season. They have a huge responsibility, and they're accountable to God. So give them reasons for joy as they lead. Bring your best attitude. Bring your best gifts and effort to the table. And then finally, verse 18. Pray for us. We need each other's prayers. I hope you know that I'm praying for you and I will continue to pray for Good Shepherd. And I just ask that you pray for our family as well. If you're wondering what to pray, here's, here's three things. Would you pray that we would live honorably and love well? Would you pray that we would reach new people and make new disciples? And would you pray that God would bless us and make us a blessing? And I want to leave you all with a blessing. So would you stand as you are able? Thank you, Good Shepherd. Thank you for trusting me to be one of your leaders. Thank you for participating with me in God's covenant. Thank you for reminding me to cling to God and count on God even when it's tough. I've learned so much and grown so much with you. And so I want to leave you with the blessing that we heard in Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated.